Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Deanna Meyer. She's a longtime environmental activist and a member of Deep Green Resistance and also the founder and executive director of Prairie Protection Colorado. Meyer's work currently centers on the protection and preservation of prairie dog communities up and down Colorado's front range. Today, we are going to talk uh, not so much about prairie dogs as about predators and, well, we'll find out. So first, thank you for your work in the world. Second, thank you for being on the program. Thank you so much for having me. I always love being on your interviews. So thank you. Um, so something recently happened in Colorado, or rather didn't happen in Colorado. Um, can you talk about the thing that didn't happen? <laughs> yeah. Well, we were contacted in uh, December of 2018 by a citizen who was submitting a petition to Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, to try to ban the recreational and commercial hunting and trapping of bobcats throughout the state. It was one of the ways that you can change regulations that are in place in our, our state. You could petition Colorado Parks and Wildlife and see if they would try to, if they would agree and, you know, ban these bobcats. So she wrote this very extensive uh, petition. She's a veterinarian. She did her research. She had over, like, she had over, she had a lot of research, over, like, 25 citations in her petition uh, about bobcats and who they are and why they're important and why um, this this hunt for them or for their skins and pelts is is just not acceptable and wouldn't be acceptable with the citizens of Colorado. And we went through and I, I when I heard and read her petition, it was so well thought out and well written that I said, hey, we'll support you in getting this out to the public. And I was really clear with her, and she knew, too, that there was no way Colorado Parks and Wildlife was going to pass this petition. Um, it was just one of the steps to try to get the public to understand how corrupt our wildlife officials are and how influenced they are by a very small population of trophy hunters, um, thrill killers. Um, I'm not talking about ethical hunters. I eat my own, uh, you know, I eat from the land every year, and I totally have always supported people being able to you know, eat food that they have a connection with. But this is, and that's healthy and everything, but this is just about thrill killing. But I did decide to go ahead and support the petition to highlight just how awful, you know, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife's commissioners are. Um, and everything we had thought at the beginning came out to be exactly the way I thought it would. Um, and during the whole way of this petition creation and being able to drum up public support against it, we exposed multiple pictures that we found on various Facebook pages of uh, Colorado bobcat hunt killers, uh, trappers, and they, they were quite abhorrent and disgusting, and we did really get the word out as to what's happening. Because a lot of citizens in, throughout North America, which is it's happening everywhere, are totally unaware that bobcats are trapped and skinned and their pelts sold over to the Asian market. That's that's the main drive still for bobcats. So before we talk more about this actual campaign and before we even talk about bobcat uh, trapping, okay, here's, here's what I would like for you to do if you don't mind. Can you talk a little bit about bobcats and mountain lions, I assume, are, are in this picture too. Can you talk about bobcats and their who they are? I mean, what is a bobcat and who do they eat and why are they important? And um, and then after that, can you talk about what you mean by trapping? Does that does is it sure. a, a giant a giant mouse trap that breaks their neck instantly? What's the but, but right talk about bobcats and then talk about trapping and then talk about okay. trappers. Okay. So bobcats are have always been highly revered by indigenous people, just like the coyote. So they kind of share the same time of, of level in myths and legends that you hear and in people's stories that they still tell. So they're and they've uh, they their habitat is throughout all of North America and they take over a little bit of of uh, southern Canada and then they take over uh, northern Mexico or that's where they live. That's their habitat. I don't mean take over. Um, and so they've always lived in those areas. They're not like the lynx. They are a, a species of lynx, but they're not like the Canadian lynx, where the lynx are really adept at heavy and deep snow. So the lynx are much more are better equipped for a colder climate. So they don't go that far north. They don't go up into Alaska or into the center of Canada. 
So their range kind of stops where the when it gets too cold, and then does stop when they're down in like northern Mexico. So they've never really been seen in South America, but they've been all throughout the entire you know our, the continental United States there. Um, they are a predator, or they're an apex species. Mostly what they eat are lagomorphs, which are the bunnies, <laughs> and uh, and rodents, and the that's the composes you know quail, some some birds, the uh, ground nesting birds. But it, and there's a lot of different studies that show that it's not like lots of people use it as as an excuse to kill them. But when they they found out in a couple studies that you know the bobcats they're pretty smart and they don't kill all of the quail. They kill a very small percentage. And in fact, when bobcats aren't around, more of them get killed because other predators come in that would tend to eat more of the nesting birds than bobcats were, but bobcats can keep their territory and hold it so that other predators aren't coming in and eating them. So they found that there's actually healthier populations, go figure, in the areas where the bobcats live. Um, bobcats are were highly persecuted or killed, like everything else, trapped for their fur um, and almost completely decimated on this continent. And then in the 70s, they started putting in regulations So, and throughout different states. It wasn't like nationwide, but statewide people uh, would choose, and still in some states, I think about 10 states in the continental U.S., they don't allow the trapping of bobcats anymore, or they're very highly regulated. Um, but until they started putting seasons on when you could kill bobcats, people would kill them whenever they could, but probably mo mostly they'd try to kill them during the winter months for their fur coats. Um, but they still had a free-for-all all year long, what they do to coyotes now. You know, people kill them all the time because they're allowed to. But until they put those re regulations in, they were facing, like, uh, their their numbers were extraordinarily few. And then they started climbing back up when they started regulating the hunt, which, of course, hunters say is their, you know, that, that they do this great job. They can serve bobcats by regulating the hunt, which is always funny. They say that about everything. Sorry, you were going to say something. Before, yeah, before we go on, um, so were they uh, extremely common? They were all over, but but like I've I've read that prior to conquest um, in California, you would if you were near a river, you would probably see a grizzly bear every fifteen minutes. So grizzly bears were incredibly common in California. Do you know at all were 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 bobcats pretty common? If you know a thousand years ago or 500 years ago, if somebody's walking, or another great example is martens. You know, nobody ever sees a marten in most of us in our regular life, but I've read early accounts of how both Fisher and Martin were so common prior to being trapped out that they would be like, they would come in to your house and, and take your food. That they were, it'd be like today seeing a mouse, you know, you're so nice. every couple, three days. Yeah. And so we're about to yeah. common. You know that's a. I, they there were a lot. All I know is that they used to be. They would kill a lot. <laughs> I mean, a lot of bobcats were killed and during the. You know, as soon as once call, you know the colonizers came this way, they were heavily persecuted. So they must have seen them quite a bit. And they were in a lot of the. If not, they were in a lot of the stories of traditional people and indigenous people. Always talked and had stories about the bobcat. So I would assume from that that they are. I mean, right now, bobcats are very elusive, and so are mountain lions. But, you know, I've heard stories from people, and, I, you know, I tend to – they make sense to me, to where mountain lions and bobcats didn't used to be as elusive as they are now. But they are – and same with coyotes, and that they're horrified of our behaviors. So they don't really let us see them that much. So, I mean – that from the stuff that I've read, and I've read a lot about the bobcat since I started doing this, but I'm not an expert by any means because I just started in December to really start focusing on the bobcats. But um, from everything that I saw, they don't have and still don't have solid numbers or, or estimates or ideas of how many there were. We just know that, as with all natives, there were a lot more, far more than, you know, with, before colonizers came and started persecuting them and, than there are now. So, and they're very rare to see. I've, I've, I've only seen. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I've only seen a bobcat twice now, and amazingly, it was, before this person called me about the bobcat petition, uh, two weeks before she called, I was on looking at our prairie dog colony over at my mom's house, and all of a sudden, this beautiful bobcat came up, and he 
he or she just start rolling, scratching their back right on the burrows, and was just it, it's so beautiful. And I was just like in awe. I'm like, wow. Then two weeks later, I got a call the petition, and then like uh, just um, after I started exposing all these pictures about uh, bobcats, another bobcat ran in front of me when I was driving up the road where I used to live, which I thought was really, you know, it was just it was just really. Cool. It, I don't believe it was really coincidental. It was very interesting because I've lived here my whole life, and those are the only times that, that uh, I've been allowed or have been had the privilege of seeing a bobcat. So yeah, I mean they are elusive right now, and I would be too. <laughs> I've I've only seen I saw one when I was a kid uh, living in Colorado, and um, it was up by uh, Estes Park, up by um, What's the national park there? Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I saw one there. And then where I live now, there are bobcats. And I think I've seen them a few times, just their eyes in a flashlight at night. And I know I've seen their footprints, but I've never seen one during the day that, that I could verify that, yes, there's a bobcat. So, yes, I haven't seen them much. Um, before, yeah. Before we go on more, um, what – like ranchers say all sorts of stupid things about prairie dogs to kill them. And they say stupid things about coyotes. And what's their, before we get to the, to the trappers, what is the, cause I, I'm, I'm sure that ranchers have an excuse to hate them. What ran, what excuse do ranchers have to hate bobcats? Do they have one? <laughs> it's a really bad excuse, but they say, so through all of this, the main excuse is from, the hunters and the ranchers were because they, which is not true at all. They eat their livestock, right? They'll eat their baby, which is there. Even, uh, even somebody who's speaking, um, he was a commissioner who was trying to say how we should at the meeting, the hearing over the petition, he said, you know, they, they don't kill the livestock, you know, and he was trying to convince everybody to make sure that we can still kill all of them. But he did say that in his, his speech, but lots of stuff that came out, you know, on the page was that they're going to kill your children, okay? They're going to kill your pets. They're going to kill your cat. Or a lot of people would come on and say, yeah, you're not going to say that after you lose your little friend, Foofy, or whatever. Um, so there's this general fear that bobcats are just, you know, <laughs> hanging around people's homes and drooling for that moment to kill your pet. So it's very similar to coyotes. I see the hatred for bobcats falls along a lot of the same thoughts that coyotes come across. Um, they say, like, birders will say that they want to kill them because they're afraid they're going to kill all the nesting birds, which there isn't any research that would support that. Um, and they, the people, uh, the biggest thing that people come about, like a lot of some, I know that somebody who worked for Fish and Game came on our site, like as a, he hit his identity, he picked up a new Facebook name, you know, and he came on there and he tried to have this what he thought was a rational discussion with me about bobcats. And his main point was, and a couple other people like that came on, that they're resilient. That, and that's, that's the, that was the whole point in Colorado Parks and Wildlife with the commissioners and the biologists that came up in support of, uh, against, not in support of, but against the petition, in support of the continued killing um, of bobcats, was that, look, bobcats are resilient. So if they're resilient, they should be killed. And that's that's the, that's their argument. Like, there's no, no harm in killing them because you know they bounce back. So let's well, kill them. One can certainly say the same thing about humans. Yeah. Um, but I don't see I don't see the point of not in the long term. I don't think. But yeah, I mean, for right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so um, that's who bobcats are, and um. Well, before we go on to trapping, um, can you talk a little bit more about their role in a natural community? Like any apex predator, their role is probably not, it's probably much greater than any of us can have the ability to imagine or understand. <laughs> but they definitely keep, what we know is that they keep uh, the communities together. Um, they take out the weaker animals. They are self-regulating in population, which means that you're not, they don't overpopulate any area and their populations are directly correlated to their prey. Um, they've also shown that when prey populations increase, they don't necessarily increase. 
they might stay in that same area, but they're not so much. It, they they they're not. There's they don't they don't overpopulate, and then they don't populate in accordance to like let's say the rodent population goes way up. You're going to see this huge boom of bobcats. They're not really seeing that with the research that they've been done. They're just showing a stabilizing of population, and then they're showing that their kits like they don't produce. They don't breed too many too many children. Uh, or kits, whatever you want to call them, to when there's not enough prey food available. They have less babies, just like coyotes. Uh, they have more when they can, when they're in trouble. Um, so they, 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 their populations stay in balance with what the land needs. Um, they're really good at keeping down the rodent populations. Um, I wish I had a lot more bobcats around here because, you know, that would help with a lot of, like, mice and stuff. I mean, always does. They keep them in check. They don't decimate them, but they, they uh, have a huge role in that, and they uh, control who comes in and out of territories. So other fox and other animals, they, you know, are able to hold ground on certain areas where maybe important nesting birds would be much more decimated if they weren't in those areas. So, and the list would go on and on. I mean, they keep, they, they keep ecosystems, or in a, I hate that, natural communities, ecosystems is a bad name, but they keep, but you have to talk that way to a lot of people or else they don't understand what you're saying, but they keep the natural communities healthy and strong and they know better what, they really know what they're doing, like all predators. I mean, they understand what the land needs and they keep that in the, in relation to what, to what's going to be healthy for the whole community. And that's why they're in, uh, they're, they're also considered a keystone species. A bobcat, oh, most apex predators are keystone species. They're going, their loss or, or their loss or presence in the environment is going to have a huge impact on who lives there and why they're living there. So one last question before we go to, to trapping, which is, um, are they, um, are they also found in urban areas like coyotes are able to move into urban areas that they're forgiving enough and prairie dogs are forgiving enough to live in semi-urban areas? Are, are bobcats also uh, that forgiving or are they more like wolverines where they're more shy? No, they are that forgiving. They use that as an excuse to kill. But they're, it's interesting because the thing with bobcats is they don't have that much research on them. Because they, and the research that they do have on bobcats for the most part, which I am not advocating research because I do not like those collars they put on those animals and how they terrorize them and tranquilize them over and over. But, so that always scares me too when you trying to say, well, you need more research. It's like, no, you just leave, need to leave them alone. <laughs> but the research that they have done in Texas, they had um, several bobcats living in the city, in one of the cities there, and they did a report on it. This is what one of those wildlife guys on our page was trying to show us. And they, you know, put the big collars and followed them around, and they did really well. And they'd hide in like the, like the golf courses between the strips of golf course. They would have like greenways. Um, they would live in there, and they'd come out at night and look, it, and that's when they'd capture their photos or they'd tranquilize and put on their collars, and they were able to track a healthy population of bobcats in that area. They didn't show themselves very often to anybody. Um, the only reason they were able to monitor them was because they um, put security cameras on them and terrorized them. But um, So the, they are able to, but another research said that that might be really short term and they've shown other things like they'll do well in the city for a little while, but the habitat fragmentation and what they actually need um, is a short term like fix for them in the cities that eventually it's going to damage their population and ability to do well because they do depend on a lot of habit. They, they need a lot of habitat to do really well like everybody. And now that it keeps closing in on them, it becomes, begins to affect them. And, and how long they can survive in the city is a question that nobody's really studied. And that Texas thing was relatively new. But people did say, you know, that you've got to be cautious when you're looking at these studies because they're really short term. And the bobcat, because people really haven't studied bobcats that much, so they don't know how long that family is going to live. And that they, they doubt that it, would be, it, that it would be a healthy thing over the long term because their, their needs are you know, having, uh, having intact habitat that isn't all fragmented. So I, I keep lying to you because now I'm going to ask you another question before trapping. That's right. Which yeah. Is, which is, um, do you know what would be the range of a bobcat 
And do you know, do they have social structures or are they primary solitary? They're pretty solitary. However, they have, um, they, they stay with their young for quite some time. They can stay with their, with their babies. And that's another big thing with the trapping and everything. And same with bears or whatever, but they raise their kids. They wean them in about three months, but then their kids stay with them from between nine months to two years to 24 months. Um, and they stay and they teach their children how to hunt and how to live. Um, and then they, you know, so they kind of, they're family oriented in that way and they stay together for a couple of years, up to a couple of years, nine months to two years, and depend on that family bond. And then they'll have babies again. They'll have babies. Sometimes they only have babies once every two to three years. Oftentimes they won't have their first kids until they're, and they have like two to six babies. Um, and lots of times they will, won't have kids till they're three years old. So there's a lot of two to three, and definitely two is when they start having kids, but three, they've seen like a lot of the first time kids being when the moms are three. Um, so, and so they're solitary in that way. Now, I don't know how complex that is, if they have territories or how much they, they socialize and get along. I do, they do go long distances. I'm not sure exactly how, but they, or how far those distances are. But they can go many miles and have different areas, and that's and right now they're just trying to survive because they're getting pushed out of all of their habitat, and they're trying to move to where they can survive, just like the coyotes do, and the you know the prairie dogs do, wherever they can go and be able to live. So and they can move into bigger areas, but um, I'm not really versed on exactly how their territories go. I just know that they, they are pretty adaptable, and I don't know how long their range is. It probably depends on how well they're doing in the given habitat that they live in. So let's talk about trapping. And um, if you have them, can you give numbers? And if you don't, that's okay. And then also, um, can you tell us what you mean by trapping? Yeah. Well, this is interesting because in Colorado, and there was a law passed, uh, I think it was in 1998 or maybe it was even earlier. But anyway, they passed a law, Amendment 14, saying that they banned all leg hold and snare trapping. And the purpose of that was really in Colorado, which was a good thing. But the, and it, this was brought to the ballot. So somebody did a referendum or did a, or did a petition got enough signatures to present it up to the uh, state ballot, passed it with flying colors. People do not want people trapping and hunting. The majority of citizens throughout all of the states, it's about 70 to 80 percent in all of the YouGov polls, are morally opposed to trapping and sport hunting. The, it's, it's, the general public doesn't like it. So they did pass that against the trapping. Um, and the idea was for the people, and I met the lady who actually did the, all the work and wrote up that, that law and tried to, and got it to the ballot, was that they wouldn't be trapping anymore, right? Because nobody ever used live, when, when you're trapping, trappers don't use live box traps. They just, they, they use leg holds and snares and poison. Um, to try to kill these animals. Those were all banned in that constitutional amendment, now it's state law. So you're not allowed to use poisons, which is interesting, unless it's a prairie dog, because prairie dogs are nuisances, or coyotes, because they're nuisances. But for <laughs> a bobcat or whatever, you're not supposed to use poisons, snares, or lake hold traps, which is what trappers would use. So the way Colorado Parks and Wildlife got around that with their, their hunting pals. Wait, wait, before we, before we go on, um, especially for people, say, in the East Coast, can you can you tell us what a leg hold trap is? Oh, so it's a it's like it's a I know it's it's a trap where they stick their foot in the middle. You bait them. Usually, you're going to it depends on what you're getting, but it's like a big claw metal um, clamp, and in the middle there's a spring. So if somebody steps on this trap. Um, and they're pretty, you know, they're bigger for the, they have all different sizes. Like they have a number, not small size, they call it like number nine for a martin. They put it up on a tree branch, they call it a pole set, a martin will go up there and it'll smell rotten fish and it'll step on this little trap. It'll grab its leg so he can't move. Um, and then it'll hold him there, usually snapping their leg um, in two, breaking it. And they kind of just dangle there until the trapper comes and bangs him over the head. That's martin's. 
same with, you know, and then with the wolves, the bigger, they're bigger traps, um, the same exact contraption. It's like a little, like, clamp. It's just like a little snap, a snapper thing. So you'll see, like, mouse traps kind of, but it's bigger metal, and it holds them really tight and has a chain on it, and they lock the chain onto a tree, or they get it down into the ground with a big, um, like, the T-post or whatever so that the animal won't be able to get out of the trap. And then it just kind of sits there until usually it's around a tree. And so then the animal sits there with a broken leg, um, usually, and then the trapper comes and kills him. And usually they'll kill him through a snare when it's for fur because they don't want to put a bullet in their, in their fur because that damages the pelt. So that, those are the leg holes, and they're incredibly I, – I trapped for a while up in Alaska when I was in my 20s. And it was very, it is very cruel. And I would not, I mean, I, I'm glad I had that experience, but it's, it's a very cruel way to kill an animal, um, especially because they, sit, they can sit in there for quite some time before a trapper comes up and, and kills them. And just all together, I mean, being stuck in a trap and not being able to go anywhere is not a fun thing, whether it's a live trap or a leg hole trap. Uh, and the snares are just, you know, little, like ropes, like a noose, basically. Same kind of idea, they're metal. Um, and they slide, so you sneak them. Lots of times they'll try to kill wolves that way because they're so smart, and they have they boil the snares in in pine needles and everything because they would be able to smell them otherwise. They can smell if you've dri- like they can smell your scent. So trappers who go after the wolves are real careful. They use snares a lot of time, and they set them in certain spots. Same with any other animal that that they would likely walk through, and then get their head caught in it, and then they basically strangle themselves by trying to get out of them. So, yeah. But when that amendment was passed, you know, all the citizens in Colorado assumed that, I mean, it it was under the impression that there wouldn't be any more trapping. Um, That was in 1996. That that went to the ballot, not 1998. 1996 passed and went through. Everybody's under that impression. And then the hunters, you know, do their little, uh, and Colorado Parks and Wildlife commissioners do their little stomping because the commissioners actually are weighted so that they require, there's 11 people on the commission board, six of them are required to be sport hunters. So you, you've got to win right there no matter what. I mean, that they, they've, they've, that's how they created the board, that the board has to be heavily weighted on the side of sport hunting. So they went around that and said, well, it doesn't say in that amendment, it doesn't say that we can't live trap animals. So now what they do in Colorado is they live trap the bobcats. So they get a trap that is, you know, that opens, and then an animal walks into, they bait it with, like, um, they use prairie dogs a lot, I found out, in in searching and trolling all these pages. So they'll kill prairie dogs, throw them in there, have them get some good and smelly, you know, put them in the trap and bait the bobcats to get into those traps. Once they walk into the trap, there's like a little foot bar on the back where the animal is. They put pressure on that. The door locks behind them. And then they're stuck in this little cage until the trapper comes. And most of the time, they kill them through snaring. Or, as we saw in some forums, they'll take acetone and inject inject it into them so that they die that way. Um, They don't like to shoot them because it damages the pelt. So that the majority of the trappers who are trying to get that good $1,500 pelt from from uh, China on the market are trying to do whatever they can to get that money. And if you got a hole right through the head or anywhere in the body, then the pelt price decreases. So that's that's it, it's just it, it, the pictures that we saw too of all these trappers doing this. They would take pictures of themselves with the horrified bobcat who's screaming, or they would take video of the bob, like, oh, look it, I got my first bobcat. And then they're videoing the bobcat, trying, you know, wanting, tried to lunge at him, and then just started shrinking in the back of the cage and just horrified. And the guy's laughing about how he's going to dispatch this animal right now. So they're basically just going out there, and in terms of numbers, um, Seven, like in the most recently would be the 2017, 2018, or that they have numbers on is the 2017, 2018 season, and they killed 1,776 bobcats that were reported to Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and the number is probably much more than that. 
but that's what was reported. Those are the pelts that were brought in, and then they inspect the pelts, which means they don't do anything. They just pretty much put a check mark on the box. Like, they don't look to see if they snared it, and they don't care. They don't look to see if it was shot or snared or what. They don't ask about the method of take. They basically just say, hey, oh, yeah, you got a bobcat. Here's your seal. Bye-bye. And then they knock it, write it down, and that's the data that we have on bobcats. That's all, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has never done any bobcat studies. They base all their studies on how many animals they're killing. Um, and if you look over the years, that's generally what they're getting and the numbers of bobcats being killed. So, like, uh, all the data from, like, 2002, they killed 562. Then it just goes up to, like, 680 the next year, you know, then 717, 1,100. And the prices reflect, like, when they go way up, like, in the 2013, 2014, we're almost at 2,000, the, uh, the pelt prices during those years when they're real high were higher. So, I mean, the, the fur market dictates – the, the incentive for these uh, hunters and trappers. And the general number of hunters and trappers trapping these animals stays the same, which is right around 700 people in Colorado have reported in, and, and have brought in these animals. So last year, it was or in the 2017-2018 year, I'm still waiting for the 2018-2019 season because um, that ends in February. They should have that data soon. But during that year, they, the set, there was 752 people who reported killing the bobcats. So and there's, there's something that we sort of skirted around, but I'm wondering if, if we can talk about it directly, and, and you would be the person to talk about this. But, I mean, obviously neither, neither you nor I has a problem with, with creatures dying. We all die. You're going to die. I'm going to die. Prairie dogs die. To I mean, prairie dog will die be eaten by a bobcat, and then a bobcat's eventually going to die and, and be eaten by beetles or wh whomever will eat the, the carcass. Um, but there's something else going on here. Um, well, let's back up a second, because I saw some videos of, um, of there's a, a few directions. One of them is that uh, there was a bear several years ago in the neighborhood where I live that got shot in the face by somebody just because they hate bears. And then it changed its behavior because of that. It could no longer do what it needed to do, and it, it killed some local guy's chickens. And everybody in the neighborhood got very, not everybody, everybody but a couple of us, got very upset. And they called Fish and Game, who put in a trap. They were able to trap the bear. And then so many people went to look and then send on the neighborhood email list, we're sending gloating emails about, it was so clear that they took this personally, that this was their chance to dominate this big bear. And so where I'm going with this is, is I've seen some really appalling videos of, of, of the glee with which they, um, torture these animals and i'm wondering if you can talk about the nature hatred because because again you neither you nor i is against an animal dying because everybody dies and can you can you talk can you really sort of tease out the nature hatred give some examples of it and then also give some examples of the hatred with which anybody who attempts to interfere with his trapping receives. So I guess, you know, we're, we're about, um, we have about 15 minutes left, and this is not the wind down question, but can you spend like the next 10 minutes talking about hate? Because I think that's where, you know, this is a Colorado issue, and it's sort of a larger issue, but somebody in New York City, you know, I don't know why they would care about bobcat trapping in Colorado, but there is this larger cultural relevance do you see what i'm trying to get at yeah so can you yeah. go for 10 minutes on hatred yeah i mean going into this bobcat petition just it was me just crawling into the belly of the beast of this culture um and that's that's why i thought it was fascinating and also sad and also like i just a lot of different emotions came because when i started posting the pictures of what the trappers were doing so the first picture i posted 
was one that of a mountain lion that was killed here in Colorado by this girl Francesca Esplin. And she had, I couldn't, when I saw her page, which was public, and went and saw these pictures, she was just, she had this mountain lion. She had blood dripping off her hands, and she was in absolute glee. She was laughing, and her commentary said that this had been on her bucket list forever and that she got the right one and that this uh, mountain lion was like her brother. It was like a short and stout just like her. And she, you know, and she went on and on about how just, how this made her feel just so happy and excited and uh, really like a sadistic kind of like the uh, sexual gratification almost these people are showing. When, even when they explain like the hunts, like this one, that fish and game person who was on our, he told us that it was like gave him all this elation to come. That were, those are the words he used. Like it was elated him to walk up on the trap and see a live bobcat in there that he was so skilled to actually lure into that trap and then kill and how, how he loved that whole process of coming up and killing the animal itself. And so there was a lot of that. And all, I mean, tons of pictures. We had thousands, I had to ban thousands of hunters. They came onto our page in force by the thousands. And they were trying, I had to block everybody because they would come on and say the most appalling um, things about how they loved killing, how they're going to go kill a thousand prairie dogs for me because, I mean, obviously when somebody's trying to stop their right to kill and trap, it's a threat. And these people get come together and they are organized. They really are in the sense of the, the right wing, like trappers, hunters. They are very organized when it comes to anything that regards hunting rights, gun rights, whatever. And they were very devoted to, like, trying to terrorize me by sending me death threats and pictures of various animals that they killed in horrible ways. One hunter or trapper killer sent me a picture of, uh, like, a bear that he had cut up in the middle that was hanging and blood dripping down from it. Then he sent me another picture of that him uh, dissecting his uh, the anus area of the bear. And then he sent me a picture of – he kept sending them. He sent me a picture of all five deer that he had all lined out in a row with their throats ripped. And his quote was, do these throats remind – do these hamburger-looking throats remind you of your bloody crotch? That was his quote. And I got – so much of that. I got multiple phone calls to the Prairie Protection Colorado number of threats of how they were going to rape me, how they were going to do things to me. Um, so, and I'll underline that is that, that hatred, I mean, that anybody could, it's, it's like they're, they're getting off on the idea of taking the life of another living being, which to me, go ahead. I, I want to contrast this really quickly with a couple of exchanges I had with with food hunters, oh gosh, 20 years ago, one was an American Indian and one was a white guy who was a, a skilled and respectful hunter. And both of them, I said the same kind of stupid thing. They both said they were going to go out hunting for their food. And I said, well, have fun. And they both looked at me like I was the biggest idiot and said, fun? No, I'm going to go kill an animal for food. That's not fun. Right. That's so good to hear that. And that's how I feel. I mean, I, I, I dread the day when, we ha when I take somebody's life for food. I, really, I mean, everybody I've known who is an ethical hunter does not enjoy the idea of killing. And, once and it, it's sad to them. Yeah. And, you know, I used to, when I lived in Spokane, a friend of mine and I would go fishing and we would uh, – we fed ourselves on fish all summer, every summer for several years. And uh, we'd be out on the lake and we're, you know, not having a nice conversation and laughing and joking. And then the moment we get a fish on the line, all jokes stop, all conversation stops. Because if we're going to kill this animal, the least we can do is not be joking as we kill it. You know, we'll, we'll, that that is that is a we we were very aware of the fact that we were taking a life. Yeah, and it's a very it's a serious situation. We in this colonized culture, I don't think we could ever do justice to the animals in the way that people who were living with the land knew how to from the stories and what they were taught. 
and from not being colonized and from being able to listen to the voices of other living beings. Um, but, but you know, within the, the the confines of the culture and what we've been taught, there are still people, uh, there are still good people who are trying to be in commu- commune with the land, eat the right food, and they have connection with their food. And not one of them would ever take a picture of the, that I know, would ever take a picture of the animal and with a big smile on their face like they just won some big, huge, all-time award for being the best, you know, sportsmen in the whole world. I mean, that's a, the, these people just overwhelmingly on these hunting pages, you know, when people would come to our page and say something, all you'd have to do is click on their profile and you're going to find just piles of, of pictures that make your stomach churn. And they're all in that cult of like, it is just the most awesome thing to take the life of somebody else and, and make them and torture them while you're doing it. I mean, the, 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 they're, it's it was just insane and to get to see that much of it coming through on on my page you know you kind of in social media you can kind of block yourself off from people like that you don't have to deal with them but when i was having to deal with them it was just a real eye opener i mean i know that's there but it was just like crawling into the belly of the beast and really seeing that disease just really the the colonizing disease of you know what's happening to our whole planet in terms of us warming the globe the industrial civilization taking everything over for ourselves growing our own food i mean that's the the mentality of it was right there you know in plain view and just so appallingly awful and most people could recognize how horrible that is when they see those pictures you know I mean, and then the hunters, just like on Colorado, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, one of the commissioners who was psych, they're, they're all crazy. I mean, I don't have any respect for not one of those commissioners. It took them about two seconds to say no to the petition. I mean, all of them were like, no, 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 no. You know, it was just, and they already knew it was a no. But, I mean, his the thing that bothered him the most was that these hunters would put up those pictures because that gives them a bad reputation. <laughs> it wasn't like the fact that they had that act or that they got pure joy because that's expected because that's what the good old boys do but it was that it was like why are you giving them ammunition to try to come after us because of course that's going to look appalling to most people who don't understand who we are so you know this is really sort of the core of patriarchy and i, I keep thinking about what robert jensen said about pornography is what the end of the world looks like and one of the things he meant by that was this combination of domination and sexual thrill and the, the, the sort of sadistic sexual thrill and this is something honestly you know when you look at the early european explorers accounts when you look at christopher columbus's accounts of of how they treated the um the, the indians and how they treated the non-humans as well you do see this this uh this getting off on domination and subjugation and that is it's horrible you know right right now in colorado they're doing a um and, and it's exposing them wildlife services is is in full gear killing geese and they do it at this time of year in the parks because the geese can't fly okay because they're molting so they go out and they round them all up but now they've been caught doing this at washington park and then we found out their contract and so the state signed a contract, um, Denver Parks and Rec signed a contract. So this is just in Denver with Wildlife Services to kill 2,200 geese, like uh, 120 ravens, um, that, you know, 15 red-tailed hawks. They have a huge list of all these birds that are protected under the Migratory Bird Act that are now able to be murdered. And the, just this morning, they're, they're, so everybody's watching the parks, but this morning they just had a video of a uh, Wildlife Services is there. There was a security agent um, at 5 a.m. So these guys go in there into the park at 3 a.m. when the goose are sleep, the geese are sleeping. And that's like your chickens. When they're sleeping, they're kind of out of it, right? They don't really know what they're doing, but they're all clumped into a one all together. And I think the geese do the same thing. So they go in there like at 3 a.m. so that the public doesn't have to see their atrocious behaviors. They round them all up. They shuffle them into uh, big, huge carts on the back of their trucks. They throw them into those, and then they gas them with carbon dioxide, and then they, lo and behold, feed them to the hungry. <laughs> is what they're doing now in Colorado. They're doing it all over the state. I'm seeing more and more ads. But the the behavior of the wildlife services 
person when he was confronted because somebody was out there at 5 a.m. with a video camera asking what he was doing. And the way he just man- lied and then he wouldn't let her walk to the truck, which is totally legal. They're on a public park and he's telling her she's not allowed to go over and look at the truck. Then she filmed the truck and the geese are screaming. They're screaming. And it just makes me crying even to think about it. And he's sitting there smiling and he's like, we're just doing the right thing. We're cleaning up our parks. I mean, and it, it, he, his behavior seemed to be that same type of getting off on this thing. It was just great. And him having to talk to, I mean, the, these people just have no idea that, or don't care. And they enjoy the fact that they're thinking they're doing the world a service. And all those hunters who would come on to our page, they behaved as if them killing bobcats and mountain lions and predators was conserving wildlife. And all of them said that. Like, you guys are so stupid, and you've heard this line millions of times, and anybody who's been hunt, uh, familiar with hunters, but hunters are the only reason wildlife exists, because we conserve them. Because without regulations, all of the wildlife would be dead. Well, yeah, they would because of hunters, because those were hunters without regulations. And the only reason they have regulations is because they recognize that maybe their children might not be able to kill uh, bobcats in this fun, torturous way if they're if they didn't like slow down the killing. I sometimes because they'd go extinct. I sometimes wonder how forests survive without timber companies and how yeah pre- how wildlife survive without humans to industrial humans to manage them. Um, yeah. So we have like two minutes left. And before we do a, a complete wind down, isn't there also, wasn't recently a uh, a wildlife services or Colorado Parks and Wildlife, wasn't there recently a person in Colorado who got arrested for uh, poaching, who was supposed to be one of the people who was protecting them, but actually was had a ring for, for selling fur? Oh, yeah. One of the fish and wildlife guys was actively killing bobcats, and he had gotten citations before for it, and he still worked for fish and wildlife, and he was doing a ring. He was killing a bunch of bobcats and selling them with other wildlife officials, and he got caught. Amazingly, that's the amazing part, that he got caught. So, you know, and, and I'm glad that they, they – and the, the punishment for people like this is not – he's still – this is like his third citation. And he's still working for Fish and Wildlife Services. And it might have been just as – that could have very easily been the guy who kept coming onto my page because um, I knew he worked for Fish and Wildlife. But, I mean, you know, it, it, it's mine. It's the punishment for, for killing wildlife is not punishment. You, they might get a fine. Like they, the, the most you can get fined if you snare a bobcat, like if you put a snare out, is like 40 bucks. That's the, that's that's under the law. Like if somebody they get like a couple points taken off their hunting thing, but if they trapped or snared something, broke, violated the amendment, the punishment for it is forty dollars. So what's the next? You know, we have like two minutes left, and what's the next step in terms of getting rid of trapping altogether? Is there going to be, and if there's not, this is my suggestion, um, another statewide uh, actual instead of going through. Uh, the, tra- the the trappers who are supposed to be regulating the trappers, what about another um, uh, proposition directly to the voters? Yeah, that's that's definitely one part. You know, we have that amendment already in there, and so that's something that we have attorneys looking at too that could make a strong case, but then you're depending on the courts and you're hoping that you have a judge who would actually come up against a state agent which would be like hoping for a judge who would actually come against the police force um, because it's the same thing. Colorado Parks and Wildlife has wields that kind of power. But, yeah, I mean, to bring a ballot, it takes so much work to get a ballot initiative onto the ballot. But if one did get on the ballot, that would be very clear about not trapping at all. And you'd want it to be as sweeping as you could to include as many natives as you could. um, That It would definitely pass. That's for sure. It would pass. But, I mean, then then you talk, you know, the real thing, we all know the real thing that needs to be done here, and it needs, we need to recognize that this, this, this culture is, needs to be dismantled. You know, and we know that the, we, there are key, no, key nodes of infrastructure that need to be hit to take that down. And really, I keep coming back to that because as long as we allow this culture of hatred and these sadistic 
people to run our government, which is exactly what the government is, um, then we're not going to win. The bobcats aren't going to win. You know, the prairie dogs aren't going to win. Life itself isn't going to win, and we're pretty we're pretty late in the game right now. But the ballot initiative would be the, the, the way to go, I guess, to stop it in a certain way, but these sickos will still go out and kill them because um, the whole apparatus exists to, to have no punishments. The whole thing is just cor- people I want people to focus more on, even with this goose thing. It's great because it's starting to talk more about the USDA and wildlife services because people are starting to see and it's being exposed. We have a governor who is total, who's for, whose husband is totally for wildlife, and he's trying to do it. And he's finding out that he was lied to, like he was told yesterday that no more geese are going to be killed this morning. Somebody's out there filming somebody killing all the geese. So you've got the governor's husband being lied to by USDA Wildlife Services. Um, and so these things are helping to expose the public to the understanding that the real problems are is this culture, it is the system itself, it are, it, the wildlife officials are the problem and the laws that support them in doing what they do so that they can clear all land for one, one species, humans, is it, it, that's starting to get out more. Now we need to figure out what we're going to do with that to really be able to do, have a strategy that's going to stop this killing because we're killing ourselves, we're killing everybody, we're killing everything, and until we start having a better strategy on how to deal with this, the same thing is going to happen. Well, thank you so much for your constant loyalty to the real world and to wildlife. And thank you for being on the program. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Deanna Meyer. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. Wow. Wow.